Paleontology is an ever-changing science, with new papers and fascinating discoveries being made all the time. That's why every year, us paleo YouTubers like to take a look back at all the amazing developments that have happened over the last 12 months. Once again, Edge has very kindly invited me to take part in this yearly tradition, and wow, what a year 2022 has been for paleontology. In this video, I'll just be covering the month of May, but be sure to head on over to Biotaverse to see what happened in June, and then also be sure to watch for Edge's video combining everyone's months to be uploaded on January 1st. The names of everyone involved and the months they're covering will also be in the description of this video so that you can watch everyone's individual videos. Anyway, let's get into it. The month of May began with some fantastic dinosaur news, with the exciting naming and description of a new kind of Therizinosaur dinosaur. This animal, based on material from late Cretaceous Age deposits in Japan, was named Paralytherizinosaurus japonicus, and had been known for a while before it was officially named, with a previous study having mentioned the fossils but not fully describing them. This paper from May, then, recognised the remains as belonging to a new Therizinosaur, and actually positioned it as a close relative of Therizinosaurus itself. The bones known for this new taxon are unfortunately quite fragmentary, comprising just one partial vertebra and a partial right hand but bits of three claws are included in this material. This allowed for some interesting comparisons between Therizinosaur claws to be made, with the researchers finding Paralytherizinosaurus to have quite slender claws with weak flexor muscles, much like Therizinosaurus itself, and therefore providing more evidence for the claws of derived members of the group being used to hook and pull vegetation towards the mouth. Interestingly, the new taxon is also the youngest Therizinosaur from Japan, as well as being the first to be found in marine deposits in Asia perhaps suggesting that these dinosaurs were adapted for life in coastal environments. Not long after, on the 6th of May, a very cool study that looked at how trilobites mated was published. The paper explains that although eggs had been found in trilobite fossils before, direct anatomical and behavioural mating adaptations had not been identified in these animals until this publication. Looking at a specimen from the famous Burgess Shale deposit, the paper showed that the arthropods possessed specialised appendages that were likely used as claspers, used by the males to grip onto the spines of the females, much like how horseshoe crabs reproduce. It's a pretty amazing discovery, showing evidence of sexual dimorphism in these organisms, as well as indicating that these complex mating behaviours originated in arthropods all the way back in the Cambrian. May also saw the incredible announcement of the first complete ichthyosaur to be found in Chile. Nicknamed Fiona, this specimen was actually first discovered in 2009 in the Tyndall Glacier of Chilean Patagonia, and a team of paleontologists led by Dr Judith Pardo Perez and including Dr Dean Lomax journeyed there in early 2022, braving the harsh conditions of the region in order to extract and conserve this remarkable specimen. It's 4 metres long, is likely to represent a new genus of ichthyosaur, and comes from the early Cretaceous period. But best of all, it's a pregnant specimen containing several embryos. The team of scientists also managed to discover an amazing 23 new specimens of ichthyosaurs from the site, including juvenile individuals. It's going to be very exciting to see what new discoveries are made thanks to these incredible fossil finds. We also had quite a bit of megalodon news in May this year, with the publication of a paper that looked at a very strange tooth from the infamous giant shark. This particular tooth looked like it had been split down the middle, resulting in what's known as a double tooth pathology. Comparing this specimen to similar cases in the modern bull shark, the researchers managed to determine that it had been caused by an injury while feeding, and was not a developmental artefact. Such pathologies are frequently seen in mammals, but are less well understood in sharks, with it seeming that perhaps the prey items targeted by Megalodon were actually more diverse than previously realised, as bull sharks, which also display such tooth injuries, feed on animals recorded to cause such traumas, such as rays, sawfish, spiny fish and sea urchins. So, the researchers suggest, perhaps Megalodon also sometimes fed on similar prey, in addition to marine mammals. There was also some very interesting Spinosaur news, with a fragmentary maxilla from the early Cretaceous of Spain being reported on. This bone had previously been assigned to Baryonyx, but this new study found that it's more likely from an indeterminate Baryonychine, closer to Baryonyx than Suchomimus. The paper also helped to clarify some of the anatomy of spinosaurid skulls, with comparisons between this fossil and others helping to better refine some of the characters unique to this grouping. Also in May was a paper published in Nature Communications that documented the discovery of more Denisovan material, which is always exciting. A single molar was found in a limestone cave in the Annamite Mountains in Laos, dating from the Middle Pleistocene between 164 to 131,000 years ago. By looking at the internal structure of the tooth, the researchers were able to determine that it probably came from a young female individual. Morphological similarities with other Denisovan specimens showed more evidence that it is most probably from one of these humans, further showing how this area of Southeast Asia was a hotspot of homo diversity at this time in the Pleistocene. 
On the 21st of May, we got the wonderful news that the statue of Mary Anning was unveiled in her hometown of Lyme Regis. May 21st would have been her 223rd birthday, and the statue was the result of four years of campaigning by the amazing people at Mary Anning Rocks. Hundreds of people were in attendance to watch the monument be unveiled, and I still can't wait to hopefully go and see it for myself soon. There was also very exciting naming of a new genus and species of Pliosaurid, one of the large, short-necked members of the Plesiosaurians. Given the name Iardosaurus paoli, this remarkable specimen was found near Oxford in the UK and dates back to the Middle Jurassic. The fossil itself is really quite complete, with the skull and most of the body being intact and articulated, and had actually been on display in the Oxford Museum for a few years before finally receiving a formal description in May. Coming from the Oxford Clay Formation, Iardosaurus now brings the number of Pliosaurids genera known in this formation up to at least six, making this a particularly rich Pliosaurid assemblage. The teeth of this animal also show an unusual feature that previously was only seen in a species of Lyplurodon among mid-Jurassic Pliosaurids, indicating that this may be a more widespread trait than we thought before. We were of course also treated to the absolutely fantastic Prehistoric Planets series in May of this year, streaming on Apple TV Plus from the 23rd through to the 27th. This incredible series, narrated by Sir David Attenborough and featuring a score by Hans Zimmer, portrayed various environments and the prehistoric creatures inhabiting them during the very end of the Cretaceous period, and was an absolute dream come true for fans of paleontology as it featured a lot of very recent and up-to-date ideas about the biology of these animals, not to mention how mind-blowing the visual effects were. There was also a fascinating study investigating the metabolic rates of extinct organisms around this time. By using a type of spectroscopy to quantitatively measure a correlate for metabolic rate in bones from living and extinct animals, researchers were able to show that endothermy, or warm-bloodedness, independently evolved in mammals and plesiosaurs, while also showing that it's the ancestral condition for ornithodirons as a whole, the group that includes pterosaurs and dinosaurs. So, higher metabolic rates were ancestral to pterosaurs, ornithischians, theropods, and sauropods, but then, interestingly, it seems that ornithischian dinosaurs reduced their metabolic rate more towards ectothermy. The study also found that giant sauropods and theropods were not gigantotherms, as some people had proposed, but true endotherms instead. Increasing endothermy also evolved along the avian lineage, but the widespread occurrence of this type of metabolism among many groups that lived at the end of the Cretaceous therefore seems to suggest that factors other than metabolic rate must have determined which groups survived and which went extinct at the end of the period. On the very last day of May, they just about squeezed in another paper on everyone's favourite giant shark. This time, the study examines the geochemistry of fossil teeth from both Megalodon and from the Great White Shark looking specifically at the differences in zinc isotopes in the tooth enameloid between them. Zinc isotopes, it turns out, are incredibly good indicators of these animals' trophic levels, and therefore their positions within the ecosystem. The researchers found that there were significant differences between the zinc isotopes among populations of both sharks, suggesting that dietary shifts occurred during the neogene in both these shark species. Additionally, it seems that the earliest great white sharks, which coexisted with Megalodon, occupied a very similar trophic level, suggesting that competition with these animals could very well have contributed to the extinction of these massive fish. Significantly, this is also the first time that zinc isotopes have been used in this way to reconstruct prehistoric trophic levels, and seems like a quite promising new technique. Well, clearly a lot happened in May, and that's not even everything, but I've done my best to cover as much as I can. As I said at the start, be sure to look out for Biotaverse's video to be uploaded tomorrow on Christmas Day, and check out all the wonderful channels that are contributing to this project in the description below. Thank you all so much for watching, and happy holidays to everyone.